Um, but first of all, good morning. Thank you for joining us um, for this sexual harassment in the workplace presentation. I'm Georgia. I'm a senior employee relations consultant at ER Strategies. So I've probably spoken with many of you before, but my colleague here, Maddie, she might be an unfamiliar face. Um, she's our graduate consultant. Um, and she's taken a keen interest in kind of uncovering and exploring the, the very wide web of sexual harassment and the different forms of legislation that do govern our responsibilities in the workplace relating to this. So she's going to be joining me today. This session is being recorded. Um, so if you have any issues with that, feel free to just jump off at this point in time and, and we'll make sure that a link to the session is made available to you um, after, after we're completed. But um, thanks for joining us and we'll get started. Okay, so thank you for joining. Um, and in today, this presentation, we'll be looking at um, firstly, what sexual harassment is. So looking at the Fair Work Commission definition of sexual harassment. We'll also be looking specifically um, at Victoria's um, legislated positive duty to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace. Um, the 2002 Victorian um, Commission investigation and report into the positive duty and the compliance with this duty. Um, why it's important for employees and franchisees to act on this positive duty as we will potentially see it legislated um, on a federal level um, within the coming months or within the next few years. Um, and also discuss suggested um, employer actions um, and recommendations in relation to preventative measures for sexual harassment. Um, if there's time at the end of this session, um, we'll answer questions um, that you might have in relation to this presentation. Um, ER Strategies clients can call us um, during business hours with specific questions. Um, SCA members can call us by the SCA helpline um, and ER strategy, Strategies Essential subscribers um, can call to discuss service arrangements to, assess, to assist with any inquiries they might have spurring from this presentation. So let's look at what um, is sexual harassment. As I said, this is um, legislated under the Fair Work Act. So it's any unwelcome sexual advances, requests for sexual favours or other unwelcome conduct of a sexual nature, um, which makes a person feel offended, humiliated or intimidated. Clearly, sexual harassment is a growing problem within Australia and it's been evidenced by the Respect at Work report findings from 2020. The report found that sexual harassment had increased since 2016 and that instances of sexual harassment were extremely underreported in this area. Um, in 2022, SafeWork did a survey in which one in three employees have experienced sexual harassment uh, within the workplace uh, in the span of the last five years. This demonstrates an escalating problem and also a trend um, which employers and employees must start addressing if they haven't already. Um, this, these changes um, with respect to sexual harassment are reflected in amendments which we've seen um, from at least November 2021 with respect to the Fair Work Act and Fair Work regula regulations, which have broadened um, the Commission's powers to deal with um, sexual harassment complaints and also deal with preventative measures um, relating to sexual harassment. So we start to see a shift um, to a greater onus within the workplace and on employers um, to eliminate sexual harassment and it's no longer an issue which can just be approached passively by um, employers. Okay, so for a large portion of today's session, we are going to talk to the Equal Opportunity Act um, 2010, which is a Victorian piece of legislation. However, I do want to acknowledge before Maddie gets into that, that all Australian workplaces have responsibilities to provide safe work environments free of harassment and bullying. And um, after the Respect at Work report in 2020, um, there was a number of 55 um, recommendations that were made um, through the report as to how workplaces could combat sexual harassment, with one of the uh, recommendations being that the Morrison government implement a positive duty on all employers within Australia to prevent sexual harassment in their specific work environment. At the time, the Morrison government said that a positive duty um, wasn't required under federal legislation, saying that an implied duty to um, uh, an implied positive duty already existed under workplace um, safety legislation. So they didn't go as far as implementing this step. However, more recently, um, with the uh, going through the Victorian legislation, we've also seen other states such as Queensland. Um, 
really, and the Northern Territory quite specifically, take steps to wanting to implement a positive duty at the state level. Uh, but we're also quite confident that the Albanese government is going to take some pretty proactive steps in addressing the remaining uh, recommendations of the Respect at Work uh, report that weren't implemented by the Morrison government with a key um, target lingering over this positive duty um, responsibility. So anything we discuss today on the basis of a positive duty under Victorian, legisl uh, Victorian legislation and the steps that we're going to take you through about how to ensure you're complying with that legislation. At this point, we believe forms a really uh, solid best practice approach for all employers within Australia to ensure that if and when, I think it's more of a when, we see the legislative shift to have a positive duty obligation in all states and territories or at a federal level, um, you'll have the tools already in place to ensure that your workplace is compliant. But I'll pass you back to Maddie now and she'll take you through the Victorian Equal Opportunity Act more specifically. So the Equal Opportunity Act legislates a proactive responsibility on employers to combat sexual harassment in the workplace, but specifically preventative measures. So firstly, it criminalises sexual harassment as well as victimisation. So essentially you can't bully or vilify a person or employee for exercising their rights by complaining about a breach of this act. Um, but in relation to the positive duty, um, it is to eliminate discrimination, sexual harassment and victimisation as far as possible within the workplace. But you might be wondering, well, what does this mean and why is it so important? So essentially, a positive duty requires an employer and a company to be proactive in addressing sexual harassment and promote equality in the workplace. It's a higher duty on an employer to do more than merely advocating against sexual harassment. So in essence, a singular sexual harassment policy is insufficient. And as we'll discuss later in this presentation, it's most likely going to fail compliance checks when um, compared against um, the legislation. Employers shouldn't aim to have a bare minimum compliance approach towards sexual harassment and consider it as a ticker box exercise. The goal of implementing a positive duty is to create a workplace free of sexual harassment and therefore comply with this positive duty. But how do you comply with this positive duty? Well, it's an ongoing obligation and requires consistent reassessment to ensure compliance with the legislation. This includes revising policies, procedures, ensuring that there is regular training and also openly consulting with employees um, as to how they feel that um, they should be treated in relation um, to these issues. Um, having comprehensive processes to respond to sexual harassment are also a key component um, in this field as well. There also has to be a level of transparency as to how complaints of sexual harassment um, are dealt with. As there's no point implementing a policy if no employees are aware of it or it's not read readily accessible to them if they do have a complaint and don't know who they need to speak to, um, where they need to go or what action can be taken for them or on their behalf in relation to a complaint of sexual harassment. Specifically in Victoria, compliance with the Equal Opportunity Act is measured against six guidelines. So I'll go through those briefly with you now. So these guidelines essentially reflect the employer's compliance with the positive duty in a nutshell and what employers must follow um, in order to be compliant. So firstly, um, employers are to provide knowledge to the network about sexual harassment. Essentially, this is training, providing resources and having policies and procedures which are readily available and accessible to all um, employees within the network. Um, they are to have active and enforceable prevention plans with strategies to reduce sexual harassment at work. So not just when a complaint is put forward, it's what you, what as a business you are doing to prevent sexual harassment from occurring in the work, um, in the workplace at first instance. Um, there's also an onus of um, organisational stability. So there must be um, employees able and equipped to deal with, investigate and support employees during a complaint process. There's no point having a uh, complaints procedure if there is no one able um, to facilitate the process from the start of a complaint throughout the investigation. Um, a fourth point is risk management. So taking proactive and active steps to stop sexual harassment before it starts, such as conducting thorough reference checks and ensuring supervision um, on shifts, especially um, around vulnerable workers, which we will touch on shortly. 
Uh, there is also um, an onus for report and response management. So ensuring that complaints are addressed proactively and there is a thorough and timely communication between all parties involved in a complaint. So it's not just victim or, uh, victim centric or orientated. It also deals with perpetrators um, and also the investigative parties involved. It's not nearly enough to say that you're investigating a complaint. You have to discuss how you're actually conducting the investigation, um, what the potential outcomes to the investigation will be, such as disciplinary action or retraining or or um, any other applicable means, and also providing support services to um, all parties involved. So the uh, guidelines also discuss monitoring and evaluation. So employers must continually keep updated with changes in legislation like we are anticipating um, with the induction of the Albanese government, and also for companies to review their policies against recommendations such as the respective work report um, and as well as the Victorian Commission's report um, from this year. Um, and also um, internally or in line with community standards. Okay. So for the next portion of today's session, we are going to um, look into our obligations under the Victorian legislation from through a franchise lens. So that's franchisor and franchisee. Um, our strategies works with a number of franchise clients, so that's why we've decided to take this um, particular um, approach today. However, the legislation does extend to all employers, so it's not just those who operate in franchise networks within Victoria. And anything that we discuss, um, uh, the responsibilities are the same within individual businesses. So instead of separating out the responsibilities, as we may discuss them at the franchise or in the franchisee level, you're not a franchise business, you just absorb all the responsibilities at your level as an independent business. So if you aren't franchised and this uh, part of the session leaves you with any questions, they're probably best to take those offline with us. Um, so as Maddie said, you can give us a call um, after this session if you're an ER Strategies client or an FCA member, or if you're an ER Essential subscriber and you don't um, have any services with us at, um, at all, you can give us a call and we'll um, give you your options there. So as um, Maddie has briefly touched on in earlier this year, the Victorian Equal Opportunity Human Rights Commission, which for brevity, I'm just going to call the Victorian Commission or the Commission for, for the remainder of this session, um, did uh, make an assessment of franchise and business compliance with the Equal Opportunity Act's positive duty. So that duty that we've just taken you through. The report looked at franchising um, and specifically the interaction between franchisors and franchisees as well as the responsibilities um, owed by these parties to their employees. So in essence, what this is saying is that when we're assessing um, the positive duty and the prevention mechanisms we need to put in place for sexual harassment, they're putting some of the responsibility with the franchisor, some of the responsibility with the franchisee and clear lines of dialogue as to how these um, responsibilities must be distributed and implemented within franchise networks. Some of you may have recently um, joined the, the Franchise Council of Australia um, and Baker's Delight, who may be on this call with us today, um, for a really insightful presentation um, because Baker's Delight actually participated in an investigation with the Victorian Commission um, to assess their level of compliance with this legislation. The findings were really, um, really instrumental to how the rest of us will take a best practice approach to making sure that at a Victorian level, if we operate in Victoria, we're complying with the legislation, but also um, to put together these frameworks that we can start to implement within our, within our businesses nationally to ensure we're on the front foot for when um, these changes are made at either the state level or the federal level where your business operates. Through the investigation, um, the Commission identified compliance areas um, for Baker's Delight to improve, and they assisted in guiding with the construction of response frameworks to be implemented throughout the networks to ensure that they can achieve a higher level of compliance moving forward. It's really important that sexual harassment isn't just looked at a risk to an individual. Um, sexual harassment poses a reputational risk, not just to the franchise partner individually, but to the entire brand. And that's where we have a really unique interaction between the responsibilities of franchisors and their franchisees. Um, this interaction isn't uncommon. Um, many of you that work with us um, know how we, um, we constantly are shaping our, um, our services and how we assist our franchise clients in meeting their employment compliance obligations and how that relates at the franchisor level. So it's a similar strategy that we're applying here and that is required 
um, in order to meet the, the compliance structures um, under the Victorian Commission. So we'll go into the investigation. So the focus of the investigation um, into um, the Baker's Delight um, uh, sexual harassment prevention structure looked at their policies, their processes, training, um, and providing guidance around workplace sexual harassment. So as mentioned earlier, um, compliance with the Equal Opportunity Act is measured by a six-step guideline by the commission. Um, and in essence, the measures are split between the employer, um, split, sorry, between employer prevention and response. So Baker's Delight is unique um, as it is um, a, a national franchise business, but it also operates in a high risk environment for sexual harassment um, and highlights the complex franchise relationship regarding this prevention and response um, segregation that we just mentioned. So potential areas of risk um, include the use of casual workers who may be afraid of repercussion if they raise um, concerns about sexual harassment, the use of younger workers um, who may not understand appropriate workplace behaviour or recognise sexual harassment if they experience it or witness it within um, the workplace. Uh, the use of visa holders and migrant workers who aren't familiar with the Australian um, workplace frameworks. Um, and also when we're looking at retail environments, um, they can often have um, a higher female demographic, which can expose, it, um, expose the staff to further risk of sexual harassment. When um, conducting the review, the Commission found that there were gaps in Baker's Delight's compliance um, relating to their positive duty, and it was assumed by the Commission that other businesses would have similar gaps. And, and as we take you through that, um, I think it's safe to say that we, um, we will be seeing these similar gaps in businesses, be it in areas of compliance, how training is conducted and um, shared between networks, um, how training is reinforced, and how we document sexual harassment. These are some examples of the shortfalls we're about to go through. Um, and I think they're key areas where we're going to need to monitor and make changes within many of your businesses to make sure that you're meeting the compliance standard. Um, whilst the report provided assessments on corporate and franchise locations, um, we'll have an in-depth look at the franchise um, responsibilities and how they're replicated and how they can be replicated within your network to ensure that at all parts of your business, we're, we're meeting these uh, obligations. I'll start off with franchisor responsibility. Um, so with the franchisors, um, the franchisors themselves have a positive duty to take reasonable um, and proportionate measures to eliminate sexual harassment in its franchise networks. Franchisors are unique because they also have that same responsibility within their offices, within their teams as well. So they have the responsibility within their current and immediate work environment, as well as how it extends to their franchise networks. Um, the Commission is quite clear that franchisors um, are to provide guidance, support and advice to franchisees about implementing the tools that are needed to comply with this positive duty approach to sexual harassment. However, um, similar to um, conversations we've had around employment compliance, the level of involvement and control from a franchisor level may vary depending on franchise agreements, on touch points, so there's a whole range of things that, um, that you'll need to take into consideration when putting together these plans. The Equal Opportunity Act's guidelines um, doesn't reference franchisors specifically. So in lieu of this, the Commission's report provided four areas in which compliance can be achieved and will satisfy this reasonable and proportionate preventative action throughout a franchise network. So I'll go through those four steps now. If you're not a franchise business, you don't need to duck out. These four steps are very much applicable in all businesses. Um, and if you have questions about that, we can save them for the end. So the first part is a prevention plan. So businesses are required to have a prevention plan, which outlines the roles and the responsibilities of the head franchisor and the franchise part, um, partners regarding sexual harassment. So making it really clear which party is responsible for which aspect of implementing um, the prevention plan for sexual harassment. This way, there is no confusion as to who is responsible for what, and there's a clear delegation as to who is responsible for developing resources, who's responsible for rolling them out, and who's responsible for making sure they're still current and up to date. So during the initial prevention phase, um, so when implementing this plan, um, we look to have a, a risk assessment formula, which takes into, account, um, into account the consideration of industry risks, 
to ensure that the preventative measures are reasonable and appropriate to the work environment to which we're applying them. A general example applicable for all networks is identifying the disproportionate rate of younger staff within their network, um, which may require policies and training to be delivered in a certain way to facilitate understanding. Um, in the same way that we could apply that to, to young staff, it could be if you have a, um, uh, if you work in a largely male dominated environment, it may mean that your resources have to be more targeted um, and more colloquial to the way that they would speak and more examples that they would engage with. So we need to make sure we're monitoring our, um, our demographic and applying our resources in a way that is going to, to hit home and, and make sure they clearly understand their responsibilities. That leads us into guidance and training. So whilst franchisors, um, at, so at the head office level, were required to undergo an intensive training program, there was no training or information um, in the report um, conducted by the Victorian Commission um, provided to the rest of the network relating to sexual harassment. So despite ongoing support offered from a corporate level with Baker's Delight, it was very much underutilized. And I think that's an, a common issue that we would, um, we would see in many networks. Resources like draft policies were only optional to implement. Um, and there was no specific guidance around how they were to be implemented and how training was to be incorporated um, at the franchisee level. Ensuring adequate training um, includes sexual um, harassment prevention, response and support mechanisms is paramount. So we need to make sure these resources are not only put together and, and available, there's clear instruction about how they're integrated into the, um, into the business as well. And future guidance material um, must also include sexual harassment information. So that's making sure our policies touch on it, our onboarding materials touch on it, um, our, our toolbox talks and our regular communications around updates within the business, that they also include information around sexual harassment. As we move into the next aspect, we look at monitoring compliance. Um, and this is a key part for the franchisor. So um, a key tool that um, has been implemented and utilized uh, by Baker's Delight as part of the findings into the report was the use of auditing. So it's not uncommon for us to audit um, franchisees um, from an employment compliance perspective, from a safety perspective, but if you're not including um, an audit into how they are uh, displaying materials around sexual harassment, how they're engaging in materials of sexual harassment, and how they're um, documenting issues and complaints of sexual harassment, your auditing tools are probably insufficient. So we need to make um, a greater step towards implementing uh, structures within the business so that we are assessing compliance um, to the Victorian legislation, but also from a workplace um, and a brand perspective, making sure we're doing what we can um, in the space of sexual harassment. Additional methods of compliance monitoring that came out of the report um, included the use of network surveys and conducting assessments on whether complaints have been filed and whether there are any trends occurring across franchise locations. I think a lot of businesses are quite reactive um, when it comes to sexual harassment. We wait for the complaints to come forward um, and then we investigate them and we can um, apply the appropriate outcomes. But the idea of a proactive survey where we regularly um, get in contact with staff and ask questions around their level of understanding to, to the policies, to the training, but also statistically, whether they felt like they've experienced sexual harassment and whether they feel safe in raising that. That's all information you should want to know both at the franchisor and at the franchisee level. So a network survey is a great way of meeting your compliance responsibilities at this point. I'll move up, um, now into the last step of um, complaint channels and responses. So this is where um, often a large deficit sits and it's something that was identified through the report, um, that report channels can be um, easily accessible and communicated, but you need to make that clear to the staff. So a singular link or booklet or flyer, it's not going to be appropriate. We need a clear report channel in place, which documents um, things such as the names of management or specific HR representatives, which deal with um, sexual harassment complaints and investigations, and the key ways that businesses wish to um, receive this information. So many of you on this call would have employee helplines, whistleblower services, internal grievance policies. There's probably a number of ways to which people can raise concerns around sexual harassment but it's making sure that that's clearly communicated through policy, that this is advertised to staff and that they know who these complaints are going to so that they can feel safe in raising these concerns. Um, a clear process is then to be followed um, from the instigation of a complaint to its investigation and outcome. 
So putting together a standardised approach that within the business and within the franchise network, you would expect to have followed um, if a complaint is made to ensure that that complaint is documented securely. And I think we touch on that later in the session that there should be a centralised register for complaints of sexual harassment but a clear and, um, and easy to follow uh, way of investigating the matter, documenting that investigation, and then placing the outcomes um, into this register needs to be advertised so that it's consistent um, and so that it can be revisited and, and made sure that if there are gaps or there's issues that we identify through these processes, um, they can be addressed in a timely manner. So that covers the role of the franchisor. Um, the franchisor at different points will either provide um, most of the resources or some of the resources, but in Victoria and under this report, it became quite apparent that there was an expectation that franchisors were providing much of the resources as well as the training to their franchisees so that the franchisees were equipped to then take that training and those resources back out to their network. So it's uh, the franchisor does play a fairly large role here. I'll take you through the franchisees now. And the franchisees um, have very similar responsibilities and very similar compliance goals. They um, should be wanting to make sure that they're complying with these measures to protect the brand's reputation, both for their benefit and the benefit of their fellow franchisees. In Victoria specifically, they should be looking to comply with this duty as well as any other responsibilities they have under safety legislation. And ultimately, um, that leads us to this third point of making sure that the safety of employees and franchise workers is paramount in all activities that they conduct. So sexual harassment is going to form a key part of that. We then follow those same four steps um, as the franchisees have the same obligations um, with a slightly different set of responsibilities in order to achieve um, this uh, compliance to the positive duty responsibility. So at the franchisee level, um, prevention measures such as conducting reference checks for new hires is an easy and advantageous preventative strategy where we can um, make an initial assessment when we're looking for new staff as to whether they might be a suitable candidate to bring into our work environment. Individual risk assessments also form part of this prevention plan at the franchisee level um, as it can assist in identifying specific industry or occupational risk within that franchise location which can then help us put together the strategies moving forward. Once identified, the prevention plan can outline strategies to mitigate these risks and moving the conversation back to the franchisor, if these risks were then shared with the franchisor from multiple different franchisee locations, it means that we can formulate a comprehensive strategy which addresses most of the risks within our franchise network and can really put together the most comprehensive strategy moving forward. In the space of guidance and, um, and training, the franchise owner is to ensure and facilitate um, training for all employees um, within their business. So it's not the responsibility of the franchisor to, to train the franchisee staff on sexual harassment. They may assist in providing some resources, but the ultimate responsibility as outlined by the, uh, the Victorian Commission is that this responsibility lies with the franchisee. So incorporating sexual harassment materials into your onboarding um, is a simple way to do it. Um, having it set as a regular agenda item for toolbox talks and making sure policies are a frequent touch point and conversation point within, uh, within your locations and within your business is quite important. Um, training is to be conducted regularly um, and they made it clear to say one annual seminar is not enough. Um, one annual seminar would equate to pushing out an online training module once a year. It needs to be more thorough, it needs to be more regular, and it needs to be more engaging. Um, mandatory policies should be implemented, which discuss preventative measures. So we're educating um, staff on how to prevent sexual harassment in the workplace as well. Um, but we should also, these policies should cover the trainings that are available and the complaints processes so that the staff feel confident um, in raising any concerns that they have. In terms of monitoring compliance, franchisees must regularly review policies in line with the uh, legislative changes and developments. So whilst they may seek some resources from the franchisor, the responsibility still falls to the individual business owner, the franchisee, to make sure that they're capturing any changes in the space of sexual harassment um, in the resources that they make available to their staff. This is important because we're likely to see changes in this space over the coming um, months and year. 
So um, as we mentioned, Queensland and Victoria pretty much have legislation ready to go. They're just waiting to see if the Albanese government will pull the trigger on a positive duty um, responsibility at the federal level. Um, so we're likely to see some adaptive changes in this space um, quite quickly. So we need everybody to be paying attention to that. And an easy way to do that is subscribing to the ER Strategies newsletter, as we will assist you in, in uh, meeting your compliance responsibilities. Franchisees should have a centralised register um, of reporting sexual harassment complaints. Um, and this register may be something that even is extended to the franchisor level. We have to be mindful of privacy responsibilities at this point, but the Commission um, said that this is quite a critical step in um, being able to assess trends in making sure that if they're audited, um, that there are clear um, documents as to how complaints were raised and how they were dealt with, um, and that there's a level of consistency so that many um, managers, if there's a turnover or if there's um, a new reporting structure, can step in and have a look at the complaints that have been raised and pick up the process to ensure that we're, um, we're complying with um, our investigation um, steps. So we need to have a centralised register that's accessed by appropriate people that can also be used um, to demonstrate it, um, as part of an audit as well. And in terms of monitoring compliance, um, the franchisee is also responsible for reviewing um, the, the risk points in both the physical and digital work environment. So we need to make sure that um, we've got a safe um, work environment. So that there's no posters that could be deemed to be inappropriate um, in the office, for example. But we need to make sure that staff are aware that their responsibilities around sexual harassment do extend to parts of their personal life. So if that is pub posting on workplace forums, text messages with colleagues, posts on social media, um, WhatsApp groups, sending video materials or YouTube videos that could be offensive, that can all extend um, and be form part of um, a sexual harassment complaint. So it's the franchisee's responsibility to identify how their staff communicate, how they interact and what risk points that could pose um, from uh, the position of sexual harassment. The final point I'll touch on relating to franchisees um, is the complaint channels and, and the responses. So the complaints process should be clearly articulated in company policy. So that's the franchisee's specific complaints process, how the franchisee wishes to receive the complaints and how they're going to investigate them. And this should be distributed throughout the workplace and provided to all staff. This policy um, or this document should include details regarding how to make the complaint, the persons or person that this is to be reported to, as well as the possible outcomes, which Maddie mentioned earlier. So that extends to disciplinary outcomes, retraining, and in some cases, termination. So both the franchisor and franchisee will have responsibilities um, in this space. And this has been shaped by the investigation that the commission um, conducted with the assistance of Baker's Delight to see how we can distribute those um, responsibilities between the franchisor and franchisee. I'm gonna pass over to Maddie now about why um, we need to act in the space of sexual harassment and why it's important now. So we'll now discuss um, the importance of why you need to act um, as a business and franchise network. And I'll split this into two branches um, for you. So firstly, we'll discuss um, the legal compliance perspective and then look at it from more of a um, human resources lens. So obviously, if you're a Victorian business, you have mandatory compliance. It's within the Equal Opportunity Act and there is no way to get around it. Um, whilst we've seen um, from the Victorian Commission's uh, report and investigation into Baker's Delight, there was a lot of lenience there and guidance to assist businesses um, uh, to uh, comply with the positive duty, but moving forward, we might not see this lenience in place and obviously failure to comply with this positive duty can incur penalties both financially, um, economically in terms of uh, brand damage, um, and as well as um, employee turnover, which I'll touch on shortly. Uh, in relation to other states, there is almost a higher um, increase uh, of risk for litigation where this is not taken seriously. So as we've seen following uh, the Respect at Work report in 2020, from about November of 2021, the Fair Work Commission's powers um, in relation to hear matters um, for sexual harassment via conciliation and also arbitration have been increased. Um, however, the Fair Work Commission is not the only um, organisational body which deals 
um, or has interaction with employers in this space. There's also the Human Rights Commission and work health safety bodies. Um, and workplace sexual harassment is one of the most common types of complaints received by the Australian Human Rights Commission, which demonstrates that clearly current measures taken um, from a business level are insufficient, which is why we need to pivot to this preventative measure um, in terms of a positive duty. Um, there are also other considerations that need to be um, taken into account in terms of litigation, such as the risk to brand reputation. What you might not know is if a matter is brought um, in front of the Fair Work Commission and it progresses to an arbitration stage, you have no choice but having the matter publicised. You cannot ask for um, the company's name to be redacted. Um, and there is the risk that if your brand is associated with failure to prevent um, sexual harassment or if there's a trend of sexual harassment occurring, there is a lot of damage there. There's also um, the cost of arbitration um, in terms of financials. Um, a lot of the time you'll require a solicitor um, and legal team to represent um, your business. Um, and there's also um, under the Sex Discrimination Act, which is the federal legislation which embodies uh, sexual harassment in Australia, there's vicarious liability. So essentially what that means is if sexual harassment occurs in your workplace between employees, an employer can be held liable. So you can incur financial penalties um, if you cannot demonstrate that you have taken proactive and preventative steps to stop sexual harassment from happening. So just having a complaints policy will not um, stop you from being held vicariously liable in court. Um, and obviously from that, it will incur um, quite significant costs, both financially and to brand reputation following that. So this is something that needs to be taken quite seriously um, by your business networks and that compliance has to be <clears throat> a central focus um, in relation to this prevent these preventative steps. But from an HR perspective, um, having preventative measures um, which go to eliminate sexual harassment in the workplace does reduce employee turnover. Um, the Australian Bureau of Statistics um, indicated that employees which have experienced sexual harassment um, within their employment have a lower life satisfaction, they undergo financial stress and cash flow problems, and also experience most of the time long lasting psychological and physical impacts from trauma which have stemmed from sexual harassment, um, which also might cause them to leave the workforce permanently. So if we have these preventative measures which are aligned with a positive duty, it can reduce employee turnover. Not just that, it also realigns businesses with their work health safety obligations by providing and creating a safe and healthy work environment where employees, no matter what uh, their level of seniority, us are feeling safe um, coming to work and that they know that if they are um, ever engaged um, in sexual harassment or experience sexual harassment, that it will be dealt with appropriately. Um, following the implementation of preventative measures and a positive duty, we can look at promoting an inclusive and equal workplace. Um, obviously, from statistics, sexual harassment does um, disproportionately affect women. So by pivoting to this method that we will be um, looking to promote a more equal and inclusive workplace. Um, as I said, in terms of the compliance, um, in terms of the legislation, it lessens that possibility of legal action and the risks, um, both financially and to brand reputation. Um, but overall, having these preventative measures in place and taking sexual harassment um, seriously does help promote to stop that vicious cycle of sexual harassment at work, which we have seen since at least from 2016, that it has been an increasing and reoccurring trend. Okay. So we'll now look at um, the suggested actions um, and what you can do um, in lieu of these prospective changes, which we're anticipating from the Albanese government, um, which franchisors and franchisees um, can implement um, throughout your networks. So firstly, we'll look at the familiarity and identification. So in order to be a proactive and to act accordingly, um, franchisors and franchisees, as well as their networks, need to familiarise themselves, not just with the definition of sexual harassment in legislation, but also actions or behaviour which are encompassed by it. 
Obviously, sexual harassment is not a black and white situation. Um, and what's been found from a lot of cases occurring that it is quite transient in nature. Um, and there's not just a textbook approach to sexual harassment or instances which constitute sexual harassment. So by having this familiarity, um, we can create a culture of accountability within a workplace so we can start um, putting forward these preventative measures and stop sexual harassment where it starts. So there needs to be an understanding in a business level that sexual harassment can be covert. It can be emails or text messages, um, or on the flip side, it can be quite explicit, such as sexually charged comments or unwanted or unwelcome physical touch um, within the workplace. But it should be noted that this can also extend to um, workplace related situations, such as Christmas parties and things not directly occurring within your physical office building or workspace. So getting a grasp over these different examples or instances of sexual harassment can assist in the network identifying and therefore preventing future sexual harassment from occurring within the workplace rather than perpetuating this culture of continual sexual harassment. As we've discussed already, um, it quite in length, but we need to have a huge focus on preventative mechanisms. So um, from the Victorian Commission's um, Equal Opportunity Act's guidelines, this reflects an ideal model for compliance, not just in Victoria where it's mandatory, but something that we can implement nationwide to get ahead of the curve if there are changes to the Sex Discrimination Act and other legislation following. So obviously, um, should federal legislation be changed to enforce a positive duty, we are on the front foot and we are prepared. So obviously, firstly, having a policy and procedure in place to prevent and respond to sexual harassment is paramount. Preferably, it must be in writing and formal. You can't just have a verbal agreement or discussion with employees to tell them that sexual harassment is bad. It needs to be properly documented and the employees must have an understanding of what their obligations are and the processes involved should sexual harassment incur, can, um, occurs. Um, copies of policies to be distributed amongst the network so employees are aware um, that there are mechanisms in place and understand the processes and procedures involved regarding not just the complaints process, but investigations and obviously company expectations. Um, and as we've seen, many companies, if not all companies, have taken a zero um, tolerance stance towards sexual harassment. Um, Training sessions, as we've discussed, should be regular and involve all members of staff. This is not something that you should just isolate to a managerial or supervisory level. Um, though, whilst supervisors and senior staff can undergo specific sexual harassment training in order to effectively deal with complaints, generally, sexual harassment training needs to be delivered to all levels of staff, whether that be an onboarding trainee um, to a director of the company. And this should be um, regular and there should be refreshes um, continuously scheduled. So as George has touched on, an annual training session is not going to meet even the four minimum compliance standards put forward by the Commission. These preventative measures, as I discussed in the previous slide, can reduce your liability under the Sex Discrimination Act. If you are able to demonstrate that as a business, you have taken all reasonable steps to prevent sexual harassment and also took appropriate remedial action following a complaint, um, you'll be able to provide enough evidence in court to potentially avoid or mitigate your liability, which will fall onto you if you are, um, if your employees are found to um, have been engaged in workplace sexual harassment. So a third mechanism that we'll be looking at is um, the impact and also risk assessment. So as we've discussed, sexual harassment severely impacts a workplace and all parties involved. It is not just victim centric, it can affect um, perpetrators and the organisation as a whole. And specifically, these impacts can range from both social to economic. So socially where employees leave the business um, and incur a high employee turnover or economic in terms of if you are held vicariously liable as a business, you will be um, receiving a financial penalty in relation to that. So these factors um, should be present um, when you are formulating a prevention plan to look at mitigating your risks, but also how it can impact your workplace as a whole. 
So obviously employers must um, eliminate or minimise sexual harassment in the workplace as far as re reasonably practicable. That's under your um, Fair Work Act legislation as well as your uh, work health safety legislation. So this can include identifying hazards and consulting employees on preventative measures such as those surveys that we touched on previously. But what preventative measures can be taken? Um, as we've discussed, examples can include thorough reference checking, either oral or written submissions um, to go into the background of potential candidates, um, ensure that there's appropriate supervision, especially if there are younger staff on shift and there is an age deficit, um, and also assessing industry risks. As the Commission's report found, retail environments are severely high-risk workplace due to their um, engagement of casual staff, um, highly female workforce, as well as um, other factors. And that leads me into the next point, um, which is assessing worker vulnerability. So this is going to look different for every workplace. Um, and some workers, depending on the work environment, maybe may be more vulnerable or susceptible to sexual harassment in that specific workplace. And that should be a consideration when formulating the preventative measures and the risk assessment that Maddie just touched on. Um, as discussed in um, the Victorian Commission's report, different industries will um, pose different heightened levels of risk. However, some are fairly applicable across most sectors, um, particularly um, with areas and industries that attack, uh, attract sorry, younger staff. So I'll give you a very brief example um, as to when we're engaging younger employees, such as um, school students, school, um, school leavers, and that teenage demographic. So when we're assessing worker vulnerability at this point, we need to make the assessment that younger staff in this scenario may not understand what sexual harassment is, how to deal with it, or the complaints process. We cannot assume that these aspects have been covered in school, at home, or in the media. This is your responsibility in your work environment. So what this means is that training may need to be tailored to meet their needs so that they can understand and comprehend the issue that sexual harassment poses to them in their work environment. Um, as an example, for young people, a common theme or a common way of communicating can be through jokes, inadvertent comments in the work environment. And it's important um, to present the distinction between sexual harassment um, and joking, as sexual harassment doesn't require um, intent. It just has to be a behaviour that could reasonably be assumed to have offended or humiliated an individual. Jokes at times can, um, for one person, may be funny and maybe um, may be forgotten in the moment, but for others, they can be considered insulting, threatening or unwelcome and um, impose consequence to the work environment. So we need to assess what vulnerabilities we have with our specific demographic and provide training um, and resources that's specific to that. I'll move us into the next section. So we'll have a, um, a few moments for questions at the end. And this is quite, um, quite an important one. This is leadership and workplace culture. So um, through the reports and the Respect at Work report was quite specific to this. Um, one of the most effective long-term preventative strategies um, for uh, preventing sexual harassment is implementing a strong leadership and workplace culture. So it is something that does need to be addressed from the top down. Um, this can be facilitated by management and then through other employees as the positive work culture builds. So gaining the support from staff at all levels is going to be critical to gaining the support of your entire workforce. The focus of this approach is to model and enforce acceptable standards of behaviour that align with company policies, re-preventative measures. So what this means is, um, and it takes us back to um, the, the communication of consistency. Um, at all approaches, whether it's documenting um, forms of sexual harassment and keeping that centralised register or enforcing policies and having training, levels of consistency, which apply from the person at the top through to um, your most junior worker, demonstrates that from a, a workplace standpoint, sexual harassment is treated the same throughout the business and that all persons in the business have an entitlement to safety from sexual harassment. So it is something that needs to be embedded um, in the culture from the, of the business. This way, um, inappropriate behaviour can be um, circumvented early before it escalates um, or perpetrates through the work environment. So we're setting that zero tolerance standard quite early on. There's always going to be instances um, to which we can't control employees' behaviour. Um, there's always going to be one bad egg. 
Um, and from that, um, from there, we just need to be prepared. So we need to have prepared investigation materials. Um, we need to be very well versed in how to conduct an investigation and how to support employees through these, um, these processes and be confident in seeking advice, such as advice from ER strategies to ensure that you're taking the appropriate outcomes. Um, from here, I'll just mention that sexual harassment was listed um, in 2021 as part of the reforms from the Morrison government. It now forms um, uh, a very specific form of serious misconduct in the Fair Work regulations. Um, so it is, if we found evidence of people per, um, perpetrating sexual harassment, we need to make sure that the outcomes and the measures are, are, mal are balanced against the behaviour um, and the expectations of the community, um, whilst also operating within the, the frameworks of employment compliance and, and procedural fairness that we have under um, various forms of workplace legislation. I'll move us into the last recommendation here, which is support services. So um, reporting an incident of sexual harassment doesn't end um, the support process for parties involved. Um, it can often take a lot uh, for people to even bring these concerns to, to our attention. And when Maddie discussed um, statistically previously, um, most cases of sexual harassment do go unreported. So we wanna make sure that when people have the confidence to bring it to us, that they feel the level of support from the instance to which that complaint is made through to the outcome and beyond. Um, so was, uh, ultimately they have contributed to making our workplace a safer one. Um, whether it's internally or externally, support services should be offered during the investigation and outcome process um, to assist the wellbeing of parties. So this isn't just to the perpetrator, it's to the respondent, it's to those involved in the investigation. These services should be offered broadly. Um, this obligation is contained within work health and safety legislation um, to ensure that we're maintaining the physical and psychological health and safety of staff, but that's going to look different for all businesses, but depending on resources and what's reasonably practicable um, within uh, your work environment. Managers and supervisors can provide array, an array of support internally um, and external services that um, are quite common to, to offer are, of course, workplace um, EAPs, employee assistance programs, if you have them available to you. Um, and then there's government funded services or private services such as 1800 Respect, Lifeline, Beyond Blue, Comcare, and of course, in serious um, circumstances, triple zero, that should be not only reflected in policy, but regularly discussed with staff as they are raising concerns. Um, of sexual harassment within the business so that they um, know where to seek additional support if the support that's being provided by the business isn't enough. 